great pleasure to welcome Guzi. He's been here before. He's given a talk. He actually gave the talk for the, uh, the Rich Maponya lecture at the end of last year. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome him. He's here today just to give us a short address. I've said to him, let's keep it tight, let's keep it, keep it short, uh, 10 minutes or so, just as a way of an introduction. And then I want him to talk us through and speak, speak to um, his book, uh, The Magna Carta of Exponentiality. I've got a lot of questions around the book, Fuzi, but uh, thank you very much. And we're very, very excited to hear from you. Let's give him a round of welcome. Let's give him a warm welcome. Warm welcome. Hello, everyone. I um, just want to make sure this is on. So first, let me apologize. I, uh, how do you say this? Um, in matters of national interest, I was held by something I couldn't delay. I, I'm a, I have a thing for time, so I know that I've held some of you up. My, my deepest apologies. Um, if that's not good enough, I will take each of you out on a lunch date. <laughs> Next year, guys. <laughs> After Zuma, then we'll. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, I think I think it's interesting to have the conversation about the book, given the moment we're in, right? So this political moment of transition that we're facing now, and what that political moment of transition means for all of us. Let me pre premise what I'll say over the next few minutes by starting with this: that. One of the things we have to think about, and think about what it means for us, and what it means about the world we're in, is this place we are gathered at. These institutions of learning that we've built to give knowledge to generations of young people with the idea that once you have knowledge, you can then become economically active and provide a life for yourself. What I suppose most of you in this room don't know is that that equation is no longer as linear as it used to be. In the old school of economics, we were taught about the three factors of production, land, labor, and capital. The research tells us that until the year 1846, 90% of global wealth was sitting in land. So just to be clear, of the three factors of production, until the year 1846, land alone accounted for 90% of the world's wealth. Of these three factors of production, one is dead, the other is dying, and the other is in transition. The part that's dead is the part we're all locked in here as South Africans, particularly black South Africans, and that's the land part. Land as a function of production by its very nature is dead. It used to hold that for you to become economically active, and for you to become an economic citizen, and for you to accumulate wealth, you needed land because land gave you access to productive assets, either on or in the ground, the stuff you plant or you mine. In the world today as we have it, the economies today that are growing, if you look at Vietnam, Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, those economies are not economies based on things on or in land. They're not things based on the production of information and knowledge. So land is dead. And I say this, and I know it's a controversial point to black people, you can have the land. <laughs> Just don't think land equals man. Yeah. These are yeah. <laughs> These are not the same things. The second that is in transition is, the, is labor. Uh, when I went to school, we were taught about the world of work. So you went to school, you got out of school, you got a job, you got a job, you got access to this thing called an income. Income means you credit worthy, credit worthy means you could procure assets you couldn't afford on a calculation using net present valuing of the assets. So you were earning, let's say, I don't know, 200,000 Rand a year, that's about 15,000 Rand a month, give or take, and you could buy yourself a home with 2 million Rand. The idea was that we would NPV your income going forward into the present day so you could buy this thing called the asset. Now, there's a beautiful old Spanish expression that says, the rising seas elevate all ships. So if we all went to school, all got an education, and all got jobs, and all became credit worthy, then the economy grew, which meant more jobs for more people. That equation is broken. Because today, what I used to do with three people, I now no longer need a person I can automate. Uh, factories alone are thinking long and hard about how do they remove a human element. Just last night, I was having dinner with uh, the CEO of a mining house. I can't tell you which one, but suffice it to say, they're one of the largest and oldest mining houses on earth. And the conversation he and I were having is how he's trying to get 11,000 jobs 
out of his business in South Africa in the next three years. Pick and Pay, run by a dear friend of mine, a fellow called uh, Richard Brasher, who used to run Tesla in the United Kingdom. Uh, Pick and Pay went through a process seven years later, the Concord has now given them the ruling. Most people used to get jobs as cashiers of Pick and Pay. That job has been automated. When I travel to the UK and I do every single month, there are no cashiers in UK grocery stores. I walk in, I take my goods, I put them in a basket, I get to something, I deep, deep, deep myself, and then I swipe and I walk out. Two employees employed in a store. The one person is a security guard, the other is the manager. That's it. Now, pick and Pay employs uh, what is it? 23,000 people. ShopRite is 48,000 people. Woolworths is 17,000 people. These are just the top three. Labor is dying. And then the third, which is capital. Capital, by its very nature, is now in transition. In my day, the capital was about access to this thing called money. Today, we know that capital is not about access to money. It's actually about access to the system of money which is a part of the conversation we need to have about the education we are receiving. Almost all of you here are taught about how to read an income statement and a balance sheet. Nobody tells you about how to construct a system of value in the first place. So people walk out and want to get jobs in an environment where you not only are no jobs available, but you're being actively worked out of job opportunities. The only saving grace we have as mankind is that once again we have to be mankind. You see, the problem with how we were taught about this thing called economic enterprise, business, is we're taught about it in a production value. You created a factory, you put people to work in an assembly line, and they each perform jobs in the assembly line. Now, you will never be able to out efficiency a robot as a human being. It's not possible. If I want to train a human being about how to do something differently, I take them away on a two weeks course. I want to train a robot, I click software update. Wi Fi, wait all the night. Done. <laughs> So as fast as you're learning, you will never outlearn machines. What you can do is out mankind machines. So in the conversation we need to be having about how do we truly drive exponentiality, we need to worry about how do we become human again? How do we do teamwork again? Collaboration again? How do we become creative again? How about bad news for the people who are learning how to read income statements? The real job of the future is going to be the guy who understands creativity and design and language. That's the job of the future. Because as efficient as you are at passing an audit, an audit is nothing more than taking a set of rules and using a set of rules to understand an environment and then pass an audit opinion. Rules for you, I can teach a computer to do that and it'll give me an audit opinion in minutes. <laughs> So just as a final note, why write the book on the Magna Carta of Exponentiality? First, Magna Carta. Uh, it's fascinating to me when I talk to people and they go, why, did the, why is the subject so complex? I deliberately chose a complex subject, not because I wanted the subject to be complex, but because the subject explained the complex subject matter. Um, and I, I, I do this on purpose, right? So for a year, I would, there was a year I traveled to about 19 countries and I was delivering a keynote called Barbarians at the Gate. People would ask me why Barbarians at the Gate. Go learn about what Barbarians at the Gate were. Learn about RJR and Nabisco. Learn about the fall of RJR and Nabisco, the company that created Oreo. Learn about the birth of the leverage buyout industry and how that created private equity. Learn about what happened in the 1987 stock capital markets collapse of the world. Learn. Don't ask me the title. Go f read a book. <laughs> Excuse my language. Why the Magna Carta? So in the year 1250, a group of peasants living in a country today we know as Britain. I call them Britain, not Great Britain, because there's nothing great about Britain. I feel like they went to a conference and said, we need to call ourselves something cool. Yeah, it's Great Britain! <laughs> Sit down, chief. Uh, so anyway, in the year 1250, a group of peasants met and marched to the gates of King John. Here's what precipitated, precipitated it. 1212, 1213, and 1214. King John, the king of the area which they know as England. For those of you who don't know, there is a difference between England, Britain, and the United Kingdom. Come see me after this, I'll explain it. Those are not the same things. But King John, a king in England, had pushed up taxes. Now, to pay taxes, remember the system I told you about land, labor, capital, you, you pay taxes as a portion of the amount of land you owned. Land was a function of wealth. The more land, the wealthier, the higher the taxes you pay. 
So these people who owned land were also very wealthy, and the, the title was dawned on them called Lords. That's why today when you sign a lease agreement, you pay your land lord. You see? See what I did there? <laughs> So, King John pushes up the taxes, he, makes, he pushes up the taxes to the point where the landlords who owned the land were, giving the, were, were leasing the land for people who, in Latin the term is tenets, people who live on land they don't own, in English we call them tenants. And these tenants were paying taxes to the king, to the landlord who was paid, in turn paying the king. He pushes up the taxes, taxes are too high. So one day, the people living on the land decided they'd had enough, they marched in the streets of, of uh, Imagine England got to the, to the king's palace and then asked the king to sign a charter. And in the charter, the king had to agree to a set of social conditions. Tell me if these sound familiar. One of the social conditions read, all man is created equal. Another read, all man is equal before the law. Another read that in the law, there is now a presumption of innocence before guilt. Because until then, the law was such that you were guilty and had to prove innocent. Very construct of human rights as we have it today was kind of founded in 1215. Right? That document became known as we say it in Dutch and in Latin, the Magna Carta, the Great Charter, the Magna Carta. So why the Magna Carta of exponentiality? Because in the book I argue something very simple. <coughs> that if the way you and I have been taught to think about the world is shifted, shifting and changing, and the pact that the world gives us, the fact that today the top eight wealthiest people on earth control 48% of the world's wealth. Last year alone, Amazon, which is an online retailer with four shops, added in market capitalization the same amount of money as the entire market cap of Walmart. Walmart employs tens of thousands of people. Amazon is a couple of techies living in Silicon Valley. The shift between economic growth and economic opportunities for employment isn't linear anymore. So in the book, I ask a simple set of questions. And these are the questions. One, knowing this, how should we lead? Two, given this, what should be the pact for the future? And three, and above all of these, how should leaders think about their role in an ever-changing world? That's it. Thank you very much.